We're Brandon? back live uh, dealing with an amendment to H145 um, draft 2.1 by BNH, Bryn Hare. Um, and we're looking at uh, two amendments to H145. The first, Bryn, do you want to describe? Um, um, Mr. Chair, I did. Was this sent to us or? <clears throat> it's on our web page, but on Bryn, the web can, page. Can you share the page? Sure thing. Brendan's going to share it so everybody can see it. And then we can. Okay. <clears throat> Ooh, how's that? That's great. Okay. So, um, for the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council. So, this is draft 2.1 of the amendment to H145. And as uh, the committee was just discussing, this is an, at first an amendment to section four of the Justifiable Homicide Statute. Um, that includes some language from the United, from the Vermont Supreme Court cases that um, Attorney Thompson raised earlier um, that is really kind of taken directly from those cases that are interpreting the words just and necessary in subdivision one. So I know that when we were talking before, I said I would add this language to both one and two, but I've only added it in two because the language just and necessary already appears in subdivision one. And that is, the court has interpreted just and necessary to mean <clears throat> this highlighted language of Division Two, which is that the person had to have reasonably believed that they were in imminent peril and that it was necessary to repel that peril with deadly force. So I've only included it here because otherwise I think it would be redundant and it may even lead to some confusion if you, if it, if you included that phrase along with the phrase just and necessary. Um, so the other question I'd like to raise before I go to the second um, instance of amendment is that um, because I'm sort of drafting on the fly here and I haven't had some time to think this through, the committee may want to go with just a re repetition of, the of this phrase just and necessary instead of the language from the, from the Vermont Supreme Court. Uh, it would probably be good to hear from Attorney Thompson on that point as well. Mm -hmm. um, just for consistency's sake. I haven't really thought, thought it through yet, um, how, how you would want to move forward with that, if you would want to use the same language or this um, language that the court has used in interpreting the phrase just and necessary. Well, but as I look at one, you're talking about just and necessary defense of certain individuals. And two, you're talking about what might be just and necessary in suppressing a person committing to a attempting to commit murder, sexual assault, aggravated sexual assault. And then we get into the probably problem of burglary. That's where I have the problem. And you know, I, certainly if, if you're um, suppressing someone from committing murder, um, that is reasonable to expect uh, to use. Uh, yeah, that makes sense to make, to make it clear that the, the requirement really is that there must be some imminent peril. That, that doesn't yep. make sense to me. So I, I, I don't know if others, not being an attorney, but I, to me, that's why it makes sense to have it in two. Anybody who wants to comment, either Julio or... Uh, you know, uh, so Julio Thompson, AG's office. I, I think the amendment that's provided on the screen here with sub two, describing the reasonable belief standard uh, relating to imminent peril, I think it's consistent with the court's interpretation of um, uh, justifiable homicide or, or, or use of force that would result in injury to others. So I, I think it's I think it's fine. I think the there's not, I think, great likelihood of confusion by what it's drafted here as um, because you are identifying certain crimes that themselves may not necessarily involve significant or imminent peril, like I, like the example I gave where someone's being pushed down so to, be, uh, to, to be robbed of their backpack may not be something that's really that presenting them in significant jeopardy and yet you wouldn't expect someone else to discharge a firearm. So I think it's helpful. Thank you. Anyone else? You want to go to the next amendment? Uh, 
which is simply taking out September and sorting them there of October. Oh dear. Can every can everyone hear me? I think my yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the next instance of amendment is um, just to replace September with October in the effective date section. So that would make um, all of the bill effective on October 1st, except for the repeal section and the effective date section, which would take effect on July 1st. And if you'll recall, that's necessary because the standards for law enforcement use of force that passed last year take effect on July 1st. So you need to repeal those on July 1st if you don't want them to go into effect. Thank you, Bryn. Very helpful. Any committee, any comments? I think we're pretty well. I'll move the amendments. Senator Sears has moved that we amend H-145 as seen in Draft 2.1. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll, oh, Peggy, could you please call? Sure. Uh, Senator Benning? Yes. Senator Nicka? Yes. Senator White? Yes. Senator Baruth? Yes. Senator Sears? Yes. Now, is there a motion to report H-145 Favorably as amended. I make a motion we report H-145 as amended positively. Senator Nitka has moved that we um, report H-145 positive <laughs> favorably as amended. Any further discussion? Okay. Peggy, could you please call the roll? Senator Benning. Yes. Senator Nicka. Yes. Senator Waite. Yes. Senator Baruth. Yes. Senator Sears. Yes. Yes. Senator Baruth, would you like to report this again? Since you did the first version. I wouldn't like to report it. No. If, okay. If you would, if you assign it to me, I will. Um, but that's my preference. Is there anybody else who would be jumping at the? Bit to report this. I'll I suppose it. at some point a defense attorney should talk about what the defense attorney does, and this might be an opportunity to say that. If you don't mind that commentary being injected into the. I do not mind that commentary, Senator Benning, and I think it would be helpful to have. <clears throat> have you report these amendments and the bill? So. Okay. Brain, if you could get me a quick summary and Peggy if you get me the witnesses please yep and I'll and Bryn send me the after you get from drafting the version would you go over your comments about defense attorneys with Senator Baruth before you make them <laughs> <laughs> Joe and I, I he's, heard long, it, he's heard it a few times <laughs> we have a long tradition of of running things by each other so. <laughs> that's uh, that's what I was referencing <laughs> Uh, anything else, committee? Committee, we've got a really tight schedule tomorrow on the appropriations issues. We've got a number of people who asked to testify. Additionally, the, um, the Department of the Office of Child Support is really concerned that there was no mention of magistrates in the courts reopening proposal, and they have a tremendous backlog of child support cases. Hmm. Uh, so we have Robin Arnell coming. We also have a real concern um, from um, the victims' advocates about the workload that um, they're under if, if we do the reopening in there. The BSEA is coming and they're proposing 14 new victims' advocates in the base. I believe that John Campbell's going to advocate 14 new assistants. And I think those are temporary positions. Assistant what? Assistant Assistance to the, the advocates? Victims, the victims' the advocates and the state's attorneys. 14 new to the state's attorneys? Yeah, if you think there's 14 of them. 
<clears throat> one could argue about the necessity in one particular county, but I won't mention that. Well, um, so it's tight, and we only scheduled forty-five minutes. And uh, we'll see what happens. If worst comes to worst, and we run to twelve fifteen, is there anybody who would have a problem with that tomorrow? Tomorrow? Uh, no, I guess I could. I'm supposed to have something at twelve, but I'll put it off to twelve fifteen. Okay. Um, I won't go any later than that because we have to be in the okay. so I have to be on the floor. But the good news is today we get out half an hour early in order to prepare for a caucus. Yeah. For the Democratic side, anyway.